So in this first example, um, the main important thing, guys, there's kind of two things that I would say for us to kind of work on. All right, and the first thing is just when you guys are doing these types of problems, you know, we have the 12 basic functions, right? Make sure you guys know, do I use y? I didn't use y. Um, but make sure you guys know what the parent function is. So you can see here, the parent function that this is going to map to is 1 over x, which we call the reciprocal function, right? That's in your notes from last class period. The other thing that was in your notes from last class period is we can apply values a, b, c, and d to this function to move it, to transform it, right? And, and in your notes, though, I used function notation. Because do you guys see that I use a different function here for each one? Right? So it's, it's in general for all functions. It doesn't matter which function I'm talking about. The a, b, c, and d have the same application to all the functions. So, But let's see how it looks then in this equation. Um, now, first of all, I notice that there is not a b here. So when there's not a b, I'm not going to include the b in the transformation notation. I'm just going to use a, c, and d. So in this case, I could say the transformations that would look like this. a times 1 over x minus c plus d. Right? And now, some of you might say, well, this doesn't look the same. Well, again, guys, what happens if you multiply a over 1 times that? It really just becomes up top. Do you guys see that? Same thing. Okay, so the a is really kind of up top. So now you guys can see, oh, OK, so a is equal to negative 3. Here's where it sometimes gets confusing. This is really x minus c. Do you guys see inside the parentheses the c is positive? Mm -hmm. Like so, look at the c is positive, or the 1 is positive, right? So you could really say that c is equal to 1, and then d is equal to 7. However, usually sometimes that can be confusing. You guys already know x minus 1, since that's inside the function, right? It's in the denominator. That's going to shift the graph one unit to the right, because it's the opposite inside the function. So when a is negative, so I automatically see a, I say, oh, in my notes, a when it was less than 0, OK, that's a reflection of the x-axis. When a, the absolute value of a, is greater than 1, that is a vertical stretch so of 3. A equals to the vertical stretch of 2. Yep. Um, here, this is telling me that I'm shifting it one unit to the right. So I could say um, shift right one unit. And then remember, d was our vertical shift up or down. Since that's positive, that's going to be shifting it up 7. So I could say shift up 7. All right. Now, the next thing that you need to know. So you should know these and these. Okay? There's really not much math in it, it's just knowing them. The next thing is we need to know what the function, the reciprocal function, looks like. Okay? So on that base of notes here, we know that the reciprocal function looks like this. Okay? And remember, I walked around to every class and I told you guys there's a horizontal and a vertical asymptote here. That's important because the values are not included there. But now what we're going to do is we need to reflect this about the x-axis. Okay? So this graph has now been reflected about the x-axis. So that means this, this hyperbola is going to be down here. This one goes up here. Um, there's a vertical stretch of 3. So I don't really care how you guys graph the vertical stretch. Don't worry. It's just being stretched. And you're not going to ever be graded on your graphing. The graph gets shifted right 1 and then up 7. Now, how are we going to kind of do this? It's kind of confusing a little bit, I would agree. So I, one point I notice on this graph is the intersections of the asymptotes is at 0, 0. So I can just move that point to the right one and then up 7. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So now I have my new horizontal asymptote is at y equals 7. And my new vertical asymptote is at x equals 1. Do you guys see that? Kind of. And if this graph got shifted down here, then it would look something like that. And I kind of made a mistake here because I made my graph inside of me. So this one gets flipped up over there. It's a hard example. So when you said saying, you said that you don't have to move the line itself. You what? You said that you don't move the line itself. Well, shifting it, yeah. You're, I mean, you're moving the asymptotes, and then you're, they, but you also have to apply the reflection. The shifting is moving everything. See how this, gra this whole graph got shifted one unit to the right, and then seven units up. Right. 
but then it also got reflected about the x-axis. So that means everything that was above the x-axis is now below. Everything that's below the x-axis is now above. Okay. okay. And so now let's identify the domain and range. So we see the domain here is going from negative infinity all the way to, well, how far does it go until it's undefined? Where's the new vertical, where's the new vertical asymptote? The vertical asymptote. One. So it goes all the way to one, and then from one to infinity. Whereas the range goes all the way down, or where's the range? Here we go. It goes all the way down to negative infinity, and then how high does it go up until it's seven. approaching asymptote? Seven. So the range is from negative infinity, that's a negative right there, to seven, union, seven to infinity. Okay? Now, it's kind of a Domain is, is the set of